Okay, so we are continuing in, I, I've, I've called this section 1.5, I've called it section 1.1 to 1.4, sheer, I don't really know. This is example three that we have in our PDF, okay? So again, we are looking at a shear, shear stress, which comes from a shear force, which is parallel or tangent to, okay, from, and we're basically, we're not looking at any bending. It's, it's from that internal normal force axial, okay? We don't have shear. We don't have bending moment. We don't have torsion because we are loading. These are tension and compression members, okay? That's all we're looking at, okay? So I'm going to keep telling you it's a shear stress from an internal resisting shear force from axial. We also, remember, have normal stress, which is that internal N over A. So um, I, I know that the shear in when I'm cutting the member is at zero, but as this goes across, okay, as this goes across a plane, and I have a bolt in there, that normal, that axial load is now becoming a shear force, okay? That's, that's how we're getting that shear. I hope that makes sense because you have to keep it straight in your brain because we're going to, all we have are normal and shear stresses. So torsion and beam shear and bending and pressure vessels, they all create either a normal or a shear, for, a shear stress. That's all we have. So it's just, is it parallel or is it perpendicular to the area? So here, I want to determine the largest load P that can be applied to the frame without causing either the average normal stress or the average shear stress at section AA to exceed, okay, member CB has a square cross section of 25 millimeters on each side. So first off, what is going on in this picture? So it's basically a truss, right? It's a frame. It's a compound beam. These are pinned and pinned, so I'd have to take it apart at C. So I can see that it's a compound um, uh, beam. Um, I can also note that AB or, or BC and AC, BC and AC are both two force members. So that makes it nice because when they're just a two force member, I can treat it like a truss. And if I want to know the internal force on CB, I can just use method of joints. Method of joints. Okay. And so when I look at that, here is C coming down at P. And I have the force in member AC. And I have the force in CB. And because it is a two force member, it follows the same geometry as our givens. And I'm just going to double those to four, three. So I have a nice three, four, five. So how do I figure out? So, okay, let's look at A. Normally, when I look at this internal, I would cut it perpendicular perpendicular to the cross section. And that means if it has a square cross section, if I were to cut it perpendicular, then I would have this nice 25 millimeter by 25 millimeter. And I would be looking at, oh my gosh, it would just be an internal normal force, right? Because that's what I'm finding. It's a tension member. It's a tension member. So I would have that internal force. When I cut it like this though, this goes back to Okay, normal is always perpendicular and shear is always parallel. That is not the same direction my force is traveling. So we're going to have to find the force in this member and then rotate that force to find the normal and shear on a rotated plane. Okay, so we start in our regular XY world because that's the easiest place to start. And I can sum forces in the Y direction and I'm going to get that four fifths of FCB minus P equals zero. So that force in CB equals P times five over four. So I know that that normal force that's acting in this beam or in this, this member right here is five fourths. So if I were looking in that normal world uh, where we just cut things absolutely perpendicular, okay, then I would have an internal normal force of five fourths P my shear would be zero. My bending moment would be zero because we would be totally looking axial, okay? When I cut it straight up and down, when I cut it straight up and down, we're now, here's our member, it's coming down and I'm actually cutting it straight up and down. I'm going to have a normal force at A and a shear force at A. And I have to understand that my my internal, 
is acting in the direction of the beam, so it's kind of acting in this direction, okay, of 5 fourths P. So what I'm going to have to determine now is, well, what are the components of 5 fourths P in this normal and shear, this new converted world, okay, the new converted world. So I'm going to have a normal force that's a function of P and a shear force that's a function of P. And I was also told that I have an allowable normal stress of 150 megapascals. And I have an allowable shear stress of 60 megapascals. So I'm going to have to check them both. They're both going to have a limiting value. So how do I figure this out? Well, luckily, I know that this follows the same geometry. And I'm at 4, 3, 5. So can you all see if I now sum forces? in the x direction. I'm going to have a normal, okay, and um, doesn't matter which way we look at this, that normal is going to equal, what is that normal going to equal? Can you all see that? It's going to be three-fifths of this internal force that we have, okay, and this internal force is a function of p in the matter of five-fourths p. So my normal force has to equal, okay, it's in the x direction, it has to equal three-fifths of this, which is five-fourths P. So my normal force is now three-quarters P because I've changed the orientation. If I look in the y direction, that's my shear, my shear has to equal four-fifths of that internal force whatever you want to call it. So I have four fifths, okay, four fifths times five over four P, and I get that my shear equals P. So I've had to use statics to find the internal force that's acting in this diagonal. And then I can go back and I can say, well, how does my normal fit into this? How does my shear fit into this? And I know that my normal has to be three-fifths of whatever that internal force is, and my shear has to be four-fifths of whatever that internal norm force is. So I'm going to have three-fifths times internal force and four-fifths times internal force. So now I can tell you that my normal force is three-fourths P and my shear force is equal to P. And that's only at this orientation. It's only at this orientation. Because if I go back and look at, we can call that zero degrees, where we're cutting like a perfectly like a loaf of bread, I would have my normal force is 5 fourths P and my shear would be zero. So as I change how I'm cutting this, this picture, and I've now cut it like this, I've gone from only normal, exclusively normal, and no shear, to I now have a shear and normal force because I've just changed the orientation of my cut. And what else do you notice? When I had zero shear, when I had zero shear, how large was my normal force? It was 5 fourths P. Once I started rotating and introducing shear, what happened to my normal force? Okay, my normal force is getting smaller. The magnitude, the magnitude is still going to be that internal force. We're just changing the components of that, of that of that triangle as we rotate it around. It's really, really pretty cool. It really, 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 truly is really, really cool because it doesn't matter how I slice this thing, whether it's perfectly perpendicular or up and down or sideways, I've created planes with normal and shear. And, and, and it, they're gonna change depending on how I rotate. Our normal's gonna get smaller and our shear is going to get larger, and then we keep rotating, and we're going to end up getting back to zero shear. We're going to rotate at 180 degrees, and then we're back to our normal force. Okay, so you all have to start thinking more in terms of, oh, I just need to solve some problems, but like what is happening? It's going to become very important that you can do that. So now I have those internals, and I've been told that I have a limiting normal force. Okay, I have a, I mean, a limiting normal stress of where did it go? 150 megapascals. And I have a limiting shear stress of 60 megapascals. So now we need to talk about area. If I cut it like this, I will have a nice square area of a 25 by 25 inch square, 25 millimeters on each side. Once I change the orientation of that cut, what happens to 
my cross section. My cross sectional area is always going to change. Okay. It's like how you would make baguettes. If you have a piece of French bread, so here's your French bread, and you want to make uh, you want to make some sort of baguettes, and you could cut it this way and have nice little round pieces, or you could say, "Gosh, I want bigger pieces, and I'm going to cut it on the angle," and now that's your area. So it's the same thing. I don't know why I always go back to bread. I love carbs. It's the same thing when I'm cutting this. It's going to change my cross-sectional area as I change the angle of the knife that I'm cutting. It's going to change the properties of my cross-section. So I can no longer say this is my area. That would be the straight cut. I've cut it on an angle. I am making baguettes like a, you know, that are going to be, um, so I'm making little appetizers and I need more bread to put my toppings on. So how does that work? So this is how I look at it. If I cut it in this direction, okay, in this direction, and I know that I have a three, four, five triangle, okay, I'm going to rotate this three, four, five triangle by 90 degrees. And when I do that, when I do that, can you all see it's still a three, four, five triangle, but our three is now what we cut and the five is the hypotenuse is the new height of our area. So if we did this right across here, really, really small, then we would see if this was a three, then our hypotenuse is a five. Okay, our hypotenuse is a five. Um, and I'm hoping you can see that because this comes in really, really handy. So if I know that this is a three, four, five triangle, and I know that my three, see my three, I can say that my three is to five, my three is to five, my three is to five as, as what? My 25 millimeters is to this hypotenuse, which is the new height of my cut. And when I do that, then I can find that that height is 25 millimeters, okay, times five over three, which gives us 41.667 millimeters. Perfect. Should my area increase? Should my height get bigger than 25? Yes. So I did this in the correct direction. So now when I'm looking at that cross-sectional area, it's still 25 millimeters into the paper. Okay. I haven't changed that, but it has a new height. Okay. Our area is increased. So now if I am trying to figure out the limiting load, Shear stress equals shear over area. My shear allowable is 60 times 10 to the 6 megapascals, which is a newton per meter squared, equals my shear in terms of my load is a force P, and my area is 0 0.025 times 0 0.041667. Those are in meters. And I can now calculate... Okay, that I could have a load of 62.5 kilonewtons before I would have a shear failure along this line AA. And along that line AA, I am going to have an internal normal stress, okay, that's perpendicular. My allowable is 150 times 10 to the 6 pascals, because it was megapascals, but it's 6 uh, 10, 10 to the 6 pascals. My normal force on that cut in terms of my force P is three quarters P. And again, my area is this 0 0.025 meters times 0 0.041667 meters. Okay, it's that bigger cross-sectional area. And here I get the maximum force I can have is 208.3 kilonewtons, okay? So I have now found a limiting force P based on that normal force, normal stress, and I have a P that's based on the shear failure across plane AA. It tells me what is the maximum, what is the largest load P that can be applied without causing okay, damage. This is technically the maximum force, but I don't want failure to occur. So the maximum force I can actually have is 62.5 kilonewtons and it's limited by the shear force along that plane okay so again it's a it, it, it comes down to definitions what is shear what is normal okay shear is parallel normal is perpendicular can i draw that yes i can 
I know that that force that's coming through here has to be axial because it's a two force member. It's in compression or tension. It's stretching or pulling. So I have to come up with that internal force as a function of P. And then as I rotate those internal normals and shears as a function of P. Okay, so at this cut, at cut AA, these would be my limiting forces. What would it be if I were just cutting it in that regular perpendicular? Okay, it would be all, it would be all normal force. I wouldn't have any shear that wouldn't be limiting. So as I rotate around, these values are going to change. Anyways, I hope that makes sense. I think this stuff is really kind of fun and a lot like a puzzle, and it's a combination of geometry and... I don't know, statics, equilibrium.